Velina manuai kale hua aloha, aloha hua tua ine. Mai lua ine ai wai kiki, kia i ke kaha uka ni. Kani no na leo eo kama aina, aina aloha e. Manuai. Delina mai me ke aloha e nga hoa maka maka mai ka mole olu mai ka o ili mua ano kala i kumukahi a kala i hoa koe ka mole olu ole hua. Good evening everybody from across Kohava i Paiaina and beyond. Tonight we have, and today, depending on where you are, we have a wonderful panel of speakers joining us for our very first seminar of the Sciences and the Sacred Seminar Series of Spring 2022, O Ke Kahua Mamoa Mahopio Ke Kukulu, or What is Indigenous Data Sovereignty? Um, before getting started, we just want to um, thank all of our funders and supporters. This seminar series is brought to you with the support from the University of Hawaii at Manoa Seed Ideas Program and is co-coordinated with the Biocultural Initiative of the Pacific, as well as the Hawaii Sea Grant Ulana Ka'ike Center of Excellence program. Um, I also want to give a mahalo. You will see all this beautiful art. Um, this art you can find by the Native Hawaiian artist uh, Ka'ulu Maika. So we mahalo um, that art for being shared with us. It is often um, a tradition now, or a custom or a practice, to provide a land acknowledgement I would like to provide a Native Hawaiian land acknowledgement by way of providing a mo'okuauhau of our Hawaii Pai Aina. Oh, I can hoya papahana motu. No, Hawaii he motu. No, O Maui he motu. Ho, ia e o I can hoya oho ku kalani. Ha no o moloka i he motu. Ha no o lana i kaula he motu. Lili o pupu na lula o papa ya ho ho ku kalani. Ho i ho papa i no ya wake. Ha no o o ahu he motu. Ha no o kawa i he motu. Ha no o ni hau he motu. He ula a o ka ho o la ve Aloha, mahalo We center our genealogy in this place of Hawaii Welcome! For many of you, this is the first time you've ever been to a Sciences in the Sacred Seminar series So I wanted to provide you with a bit of history as to how this seminar series came to be this began in 2016 when the IUCN came to Hawaii for the first time and members of the Biocultural Initiative of the Pacific put together a seminar series called Land, Seas and Skies, a conversation with science, tradition and the sacred. And we brought together traditional knowledge holders, guardians of sacred lands, natural scientists and academics, as well as managers to highlight the possibilities of collaboration and understanding to protect the biodiversity and to support indigenous land rights, sacred sites and territories. We also wanted to create a dialogue on differing approaches to Western science, tradition and the sacred and to bring into conversation and use the word sacred in application to the sciences. Um, we continued that conversation in 2019 in response to much of the activity that was going on on Mauna Awakea and we iterated this and foregrounded discussions to provide the UH community with a broader understanding of why Mauna Kea is sacred from multiple perspectives. And each seminar that we had paired a Hawaiian practitioner with a UH Manoa faculty member around topics from various knowledge systems, looking at atmospheric sacredness of Mauna Wakea to the geological sacredness. And the intent of this seminar series was and continues to be to create an indigenous centered space to dialogue about complex issues. This year, our thought is to, to focus on and bring to knowledge within the broader Hawaiian community, indigenous data sovereignty. What is indigenous data? What is data sovereignty? 
Our intentions are to center conversations with Indigenous practitioners from continental as well as oceanic spaces and to create a dialogue between Kanaka O'ibi, Native Hawaiian, and allies in other Indigenous communities so that we can be proactive in laying the groundwork for collaborative partnerships within Hawaii. And so we really want to utilize these conversations this semester to advance Kanaka OEV efforts towards data sovereignty. So as I said, the, the main point of this series is what is Indigenous data sovereignty? We can't go very far without acknowledging, um, this is really a leo aloha in remembrance of Dr. Moana Jackson, who was a prolific and amazing and cherished leader of Indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, Matua Moana co-founded the Maori Legal Service and led the working group that drafted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and dedicated 20 years of his life to passing this, um, this declaration. And today it's a foundational work in Indigenous data sovereignty scholarship and Indigenous politics. So I really felt we could not start our conversation without first acknowledging um, the passing of this great scholar. So. Um, and now I want to go on and, and introduce the, the speakers for tonight. So I want to welcome Dr. Stephanie Russo Carroll. Dr. Stephanie Russo Carroll is an Atna and Sicilian descent woman from Alaska. She is based at the University of Arizona, where she is an assistant professor of public health, associate director for the Native Nations Institute, and assistant research professor at the Udall Center. Her interdisciplinary research group, the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance, develops research, policy, and practice innovations for Indigenous data sovereignty. Stephanie chairs the Global Indigenous Data Alliance and the Indigenous Working Group for the IEE P2890 Recommended Practice for Prominence of Indigenous Peoples Data. And I want to say that um, th these links as well as additional information for both um, Dr. Carroll and uh, Mr. Hudson will be available on the Sciences in the Sacred website so that you can have additional learning opportunities. We're also very uh, grateful to have Mr. Maui Hudson. Uh, Maui is from um, Whakatohea, Naruahine, and Te Mahurehure. He's an associate professor and director of Te Kotahi Research Institute at the University of Waikato, focusing on the application of Matauranga Māori to decision-making across a range of contemporary contexts. Maui also advocates for Indigenous rights and interests through Te Manararaunga Māori, Māori Data Sovereignty Network and the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, and he's the co-director of Local Context, the Veracity Lab, and Enrich. So um, traditionally, it would be, this is the time in our program where I would give lay to our speakers, and um, because I am not with you, I instead will um, give you the oli that we, we say when we give lay. So. No punya kawaine, no talua no iti lawe. So with that, I give you this virtual lay of aloha and um, mahalo. I'm now going to pass the uh, stage over to Maui and to uh, Stephanie. Thank you and hello to everybody. I'm so grateful to be in this space and to be um, with uh, Rosie here doing this work. Um, it's a long time coming and I'm very, very glad to be able to make these connections and um, to share some of the work that's been going on internationally and um, within the continental US, um, what I'd call from the Alaska perspective, the uh, lower 48. And so I'll begin just with an introduction. So Siduk Atna Kastan, Siduk Stephanie Carroll, Slanduk Nalchina. Hello, I'm Stephanie Carroll. Um, and I'm from the native village of Kurika along the Copper River in Alaska. And um, I come to you today uh, from the um, 
University of Arizona, where we are on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. So today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson, where I am, being home to the Atham and the Yaqui. What I'm going to do is provide a situational grounding for indigenous data sovereignty, and then I will hand off to um, Maui, who will uh, provide some um, more concrete examples of the work that's been going on, um, particularly within Aotearoa. So a quick tour of some key guiding points and positioning statements when we think about indigenous peoples and data. First of all, sovereignty matters. And when we talk about sovereignty from the perspective of the indigenous data sovereignty movement, we recognize inherent sovereignty or the sovereignty um, that is within our indigenous peoples across the globe, whether they're recognized or not. And we know here um, in the United States that we have a lot of different situations, including federally recognized, state recognized, unrecognized um, in Hawaii and across our um, US territories. And so um, we are actively thinking through and making sure that we're raising up voices from all of those communities, particularly within the context of the United States. Another really grounding perspective is that data are a relation. Um, when we forget that, we forget the responsibilities we hold to the information and to the people who, to which it relates. Only Indigenous peoples can exercise Indigenous data sovereignty. We have lots of partners and um, relationships to activate that. Um, enacting Indigenous data sovereignty includes both data for governance and governance of data, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, Indigenous-driven data work requires relationships with other data actors and experts for both stewardship and expertise. And assertions of indigenous data sovereignty spur innovation and design in data and research policy and practice. Um, and I share a, a photo here from the culture camp for um, one of our communities. Uh, and you notice how we have um, the youth in the middle and, and this camp was around food sovereignty and indigenous data sovereignty um, that day are topics. And so um, really listening to and learning from the perspectives of the youth, but also connecting them out through um, our elders and um, then the more worker bee type people like me who are standing in the back um, and really recognizing the power of the connection of youth and elders in doing this type of work. So I wanna begin um, by recognizing my uh, colleague, Dr. Dominique David Chavez, um, who developed um, this perceptive scale of um, levels of community engagement and research to assess how researchers access indigenous knowledge systems and how they actively engage with the communities um, and community members who maintain those systems. So this, um, this scale here um, comes from a global systemic um, a systematic review analyzing 20 years of climate studies. And so these studies um, all um, included indigenous knowledge in their research. And what Dr. David Chavez found was that 87% of these studies were extractive. Um, they represented the colonial legacy of taking knowledge out of community and not actively participating um, or including those who hold those knowledges. And so, um, what, what those were is in this, on the left side here, thinking about no engagement or contractual engagement or consultative engagement. And um, what she also found though, was that there were a number of places where these climate studies and, and climate adaptation and, and um, climate activities were indigenous led and indigenous um, uh, aligning with indigenous values. And really what she wanted to know was what does it look like in practice? Um, and how can we lift, lift up and uphold those stories so that we understand how to move from these extractive practices to self-determined um, indigenous practices within um, research and data. And so indigenous data sovereignty really works at this end of the scale of thinking about how do we move forward and um, how do we move institutions from the extractive colonial data practices and reconfigure power relationships to put indigenous data in indigenous hands. So indigenous knowledge systems we know are um, the, the basis for our information and knowledge. And from the continental US, we have some examples here of how indigenous peoples were recording information, sharing information over time. Um, we have the Sioux winter counts. We have a awesome calendar stick, which comes from um, where I'm sitting here today. 
a wampum belt and a totem pole. And, and these all serve different functions. You know, sometimes they're just um, as a totem pole can, um, can, can you give you basic information about place? Whereas some, um, a wampum belt can actively, actively be a contract. Um, and convey the relational aspects between parties. And so we know that we had these, um, and we continue to have these um, systems of, of maintaining and sharing and storing information in our own communities. Um, but our settler colonial experience has been comprised of many efforts to kill or suppress or co-opt our indigenous knowledge systems, as well as the ways that we care for and, and share our information and knowledge. And so today, when we talk about indigenous people's data, um, from a very high level perspective, we think about data as being um, information and knowledge in any format. Um, so it doesn't have to be digital. It can be um, one of our belongings. It could be a ceremonial object. It could be um, our stories and so forth. And, um, they, these data can be things that are held within our indigenous communities, but we also know there's a lot of data about us as indigenous peoples and our territories and our life ways that are held in other places. So indigenous peoples data are include knowledge about our environments, um, include knowledge about data as uh, individuals. So our health data, our social data, even our social network data as well as data about us as peoples, our traditions and cultural information, our oral histories um, and our, our stories, as I said. And so these are really important conceptions because from a very um, mainstream perspective, data is thought of as only digital, um, but we're concerned about all of our relations because everything today can be digitized. Um, and we want to be able to, to be able to keep that relationship as things become digitized. So we know in the United States, and this is often replicated in other places, that um, the co-optation of our knowledge systems, the taking of our knowledge by others um, has created and, and really um, gives life to a data divide, rendering indigenous peoples largely dependent on other governments, researchers, and institutions for their data. Um, we're in transition and, and working through how to um, move back to our indigenous run data systems, but this data dependency has been sustained through this, um, this paradox of scarcity and abundance a lot of data that are collected about indigenous peoples and nations, but really by or for indigenous peoples purposes. So many of these data do not recognize or privilege our um, indigenous worldviews. They don't benefit indigenous people. And as a result, indigenous data landscapes are largely characterized by inconsistent, inaccurate and irrelevant data for indigenous peoples. Um, for instance, if you look up in the continental US at the Indian Health Service, you're often presented health outcomes that compare um, American Indian Alaska Native people with everybody else um, and that data are old. And so there's not a, little, a lot of data that we can find out about our communities um, or that we have as com communities. Um, there's a lack of, like I said, community level data and we see it at the aggregate of American Indian Alaska Native and we see really a lot of data that describe indigenous peoples um, and our relationships with land and territories through a deficit lens in which we are compared to the rest of the uh, population. And so, whoops, sorry. I lost my little cursor there. Um, and so this, our ability to, um, oh boy. Uh, to, to be able to tell stories about our people um, has been limited by the, our inability to have data that are meaningful to us. So this study that I, that I show here was an effort to create a lot of data about our indigenous youth um, in, the lower, in the lower 48 states. Um, but we analyzed that data. So the indigenous youth are the purple pieces there. Um, and everybody else, as I said, when we compared to everybody else, are the blue pieces there. And so what, what the story was from this, this analysis was that, um, that indigenous youth had much higher rates of substance abuse, binge drinking, and that kind of stuff um, than the rest of the youth. But then when you look into um, and look at that, what you also see is that over time, so those bands are different grade levels, 
um, of or different ages of, of students, over time, those levels aren't rising. And so nobody in that paper or in the analysis is really asking, what are protecting those kids from not taking up um, uh, substance use or alcohol drinking as they get um, older, um, like you see in the other population. Um, we also see a uh, external control of data that I've talked about a little bit, as well as um, lack of external support for data infrastructure and capability and basically complete erasure. And so this, um, I'm sure some of you have seen was from the CNN exit poll from a couple of years ago where um, indigenous peoples have just been erased from the data um, and um, we're not present at all. We're just something else in the story of the United States. So we're gonna shift the lens and really think through what is indigenous data sovereignty and how do we move through um, and reassert um, our relationships with data uh, within the context of our lives today and that align with our values. So indigenous data sovereignty is the right of indigenous peoples to govern their data from collection and storage to use and reuse. So um, it finds its foundations in inherent sovereignty. Um, only indigenous peoples and nations as rights holders can exercise that indigenous data sovereignty. More importantly too, is that indigenous data sovereignty is a responsibility and an expression of the ways, traditions, and roles that communities have for the care and use of their knowledge. Um, it uses a human rights framework. It leverages tools such as laws, policies, and agreements, including what Rosie was speaking about, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, Indigenous data sovereignty really underscores that knowledge belongs to the collective and is fundamental to who we are as, as Indigenous peoples. So data are really critical to the exercise of sovereignty. Indigenous peoples require data for governance and self-determined decision-making. And at the same time, they begin to, and like many other governments, institutions, and corporations, create and enact data policies and practices that are aligned with their values and knowledge systems. So these activities of indigenous data governance are means of implementing greater indigenous data sovereignty. So what we're seeing now is more and more indigenous um, peoples and communities are rebuilding their governance systems around knowledge and reclaiming their data. So over the past five years, um, actually it's probably seven years now, uh, there's been increased scholarship and activity um, internationally and then within some of our nation states around indigenous data sovereignty. And so, um, as well as putting forth um, frameworks and principles for indigenous data governance at various levels. And so what you see here in the center, that yellow star, as the OCAP principles from the First Nations in Canada. And those have really have been, um, along with the you know, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, one of the grounding elements of the Indigenous data sovereignty movement since they've been around since the 90s. Um, and um, real inspiration. And then we've seen books come out, um, the, the really foundational Indigenous data sovereignty book by uh, Tahu Kukatai and John Taylor. Um, and we've also seen, in addition to First Nations in Canada putting out um, principles for um, Indigenous data and information, something that Maori, uh, Maui will talk about, the principles of Maori data sovereignty, um, uh, which are um, these kind of mid-level principles. So we can think about principles for Indigenous data at three levels, really high-level care principles, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, these mid-level principles, which um, uh, communities or iwis or tribes might come together and create, so the First Nations did and the Maori principles, or um, community-based, um, uh, in, in the lower 40, tribally-based um, principles for the care and, and curation of our data. So I'll speak a little bit to the care principles, and like I said, now we will kind of drill down those, to those lower levels of um, more um, mid-level and then community level activations of indigenous data sovereignty. And so the care principles um, are meant, as I said, as these high level expectations for um, non-indigenous data actors um, to adhere to the rights of indigenous peoples to, to, to have persistent relationships with their data. So in 2019, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance or GITA released the principles, um, which are collective benefit, 
authority to control, responsibility and ethics, and the sub-principles. And they really set forth critical standards, really moving towards a more um, ethical standpoint in the data landscape. So we'd, we'd seen all of these data principles that had to do with how do we increase sharing of data? How do we make data machine actionable? Um, and these principles, the care principles, really think about the people and the purpose of data and, and maintaining those relationships over time. And, and so the reason why this came about was this long standing situation where we've seen that the majority of indigenous data ranging from ethnographic material to biological um, specimens to earth observation and so far, so on are neither fair nor care. Um, and they can be hard to find because of that. They can be buried in researcher collections um, in these large data sets or repositories in museums and so forth. Um, and oftentimes they're mislabeled, so they don't in indicate the indigenous peoples who are related to those data, and they're not searchable. Uh, thus, these collections and data are not fair and do not perpetuate our relationships as indigenous peoples um, throughout time with those data. So it doesn't perpetuate our relationship naming that through provenance. It doesn't speak to the protocols we might have for the care and use of that information or the sharing of that information or even the permission that communities give for the use of that um, or how it's permitted to be used. So one of the other things about indigenous data sovereignty is that um, we wanna make sure at all times that our um, indigenous data sovereignty is grounded in indigenous peoples, nations, and communities. And we have these active networks um, that you heard us speak about, the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, GITA, the um, Tamano Ravanga, the Maori Data Sovereignty Network, um, as well as a lot of other people who are working in the sphere. And it's kind of blown up in the past, I'd say, a year or two with more and more people interested in activating and supporting indigenous rights to data. Um, and the, the whole arena now that we see um, around indigenous data sovereignty is working to create lots of different pockets of activity. And I talk a lot about um, scaffolding. So we need change in different types of institutions. So at universities, at governments, at corporations, um, and um, in our communities and little changes over time um, really bolster and, and help to make sure that um, we're increasing our relationships with data. Um, and on the other side of that is that um, we can have the changes in different places. So we can create practical tools, we can create policy changes, we can, we can create legal tools, um, we can build up the capacity and capability within our communities to do data work and to store data, both physically store data and data centers, or to be able to use data as well. And so it's important that we not be struck by how, how grand the challenges are, but by how broad and, um, and the opportunities are. One of the other things that Indigenous data sovereignty is really concerned with is to create law, policy, ethics, and infrastructure that really support Indigenous rights to data throughout the data life cycle. Um, so the data life cycle is really where, how data comes into being, um, where it's stored, how it's used, um, who controls those decisions, um, and so forth. And so if, um, uh, if we move to strengthen these rights by making changes, even minimal at first, like I said, across these different places where data are, um, we really work to move towards having um, more robust relationships with our data. So I am going to um, close here with just talking a little bit informally about indigenous data sovereignty in the US. Um, one of the, the, the grand challenges that I came up with um, when I started first working with indigenous data sovereignty in around 2015 in the US was our federal um, uh, administration. And so it was really hard to make changes um, in the federal system um, and that had ripple down effects. And so what you began to see um, in the US, particularly in the lower 48 sta states, was a lot of community action and interest around data. So more and more conversations at the community level about um, how do we make sure that we are connected to the information about our flora and fauna. So for instance, um, uh, from my communities, 
how do we maintain our relationship with the salmon and really think of uh, as salmon as, as a relationship um, and the information about them as something that we have a responsibility to um, and how they can lead us to make sure that's a robust responsibility. Um, so we have these very grounded and community actions happening. And then also um, for those of us who've been working in more advocacy angles of it, we began to work internationally um, to make changes, for instance, setting forth the care principles. Um, and now we've seen the care principles come to life, for instance, in the UN, um, UNESCO recommendations on open science. Um, you're beginning to see them trickle into some um, nation state policies. So for instance, in um, uh, Australia, their um, code of ethics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research um, names the fair care principles as, as, um, as to be adhered to during research processes. And so um, the importance for us here in the US is while we might not have been able to make change at the federal level, um, we, there's the change that's happening and setting kind of expectations on the ground in communities. And so we talk about a lot about indigenous expectations for how we want our relationships with data to be. Um, and then these high level ex expectations coming from the international global community. Um, and so uh, some of the other activities that you saw around indigenous data sovereignty too over the past five years or so were um, really working to establish connection then among indigenous peoples um, with around indigenous data sovereignty, um, raising awareness about indigenous data sovereignty, which is what Maui and I and, and Rosie and others are doing here today, um, and doing that in a lot of contexts. And, um, and that's part of that whole scaffolding process that I talked about a little bit. Um, developing policy recommendations, and this is becoming more and more acceptable within our um, United States context today is to develop these, these recommendations, for instance, for places like the National Institutes of Health, but also for foundations and universities. You see a lot of action in universities actually today. Um, that's one of the most ripe spheres, I think. And then um, really to identify new and emerging possibilities and challenges. And I think one of the greatest possibilities that we have um, is to work together um, to begin to leverage and protect um, the rights and responsibilities we have as Indigenous peoples in the U.S. Um, to make changes um, across all of these environments that we work with or where we, where we find Indigenous data and we really want to make sure that we continue to have those relationships. Um, so at this point I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over the baton to Maui, um, who's going to give us some perspectives from the work he's been doing in Aerosphere New Zealand. And I'm really excited um, for him to present this and give some more grounding context, kind of narrowing down before we have our conversation in a bit. Mahalo Nui. Um, Steph, before Maui goes, I just wanted to um, remind our audience that if you have any questions, you can feel free to put it either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, also, if you would like to kind of follow along with the words, we have enabled live transcripts, so you just have to press that little carrot next to the CC and you can choose to see the captions if you would like. You don't have to, but that ability is there. So, um, sorry, mahalo nui and carry on Maui, mahalo. Uh, uh, Mark your te maunga, uh, ko waia wa te awa, uh, ko opapi te marae, ko ngai tamate hapu, ko whakatohi te iwi, ko Maui Hudson tuku ingoa, mō reira, uh, loha mai kakou. Um, just wanted to uh, just sort of endorse the, um, the greetings that were made at the beginning and acknowledgements to land and to our ancestors and in particular to Moana. Uh, it's been really, um, it's been really interesting watching all the Twitter feeds and everyone talking about the impact he's had on the way that they, you know, thought about uh, life and thought about indigenous issues. And he was actually probably the person that conscientized me uh, before I even knew what the word conscientized mean. Um, and it was sort of at the end of high school, 
um, when all you're worried about is playing sports and finding girls and all that sort of stuff and got the chance to go and be part of a, um, a gathering of a gathering a gathering of youth and it was the first time I'd been introduced to discussions about really our history and the Treaty of Waitangi and um, sent a, a number of references to the time that he had for uh, the time that he had for sharing that information with youth and I was one of those people as well so just wanted to um, mihi to him and also to the kaupapa partly because you know these all of these things indigenous data sovereignty build off um, the work that's been done in other spaces even if it didn't share the same name and I think that that's what we see a little bit with this kaupapa so I've got some slides as well um, I'm going to share them and um, as Rosie said, we're really looking forward to questions and trying to uh, you know, sort of just really think a little bit more about how this plays out in different contexts. And, and so part of, um, I guess part of the story I'll talk about is the story of uh, Indigenous status sovereignty in Aotearoa and um, in part the establishment of Tamanara Ranga as the Māori Data uh, Sovereignty Network and this is um, you know essentially their, their web, uh, website, the, the, the front of their web page. I think those you know this, this element which you would have heard come through in Stephanie's um, talk about the importance of data and how data is being used to increasingly make uh, or inform decisions that get made about our lives and particularly ones, particularly decisions that other people are making and how they justify them to exclude us or include us or, or kind of work out how much, how much resources we should get or what sorts of things should be recognised. So um, I think that is uh, becoming more and more prevalent as we're moving into the future and so that is data is the thing that is starting to affect um, the way our sovereignty is expressed, not only by ourselves, but how others try to, to shape and limit in different ways. And I want to make a, uh, a little bit of a point around um, a number of people talk about data sovereignty and they use the, the term data sovereignty when they're talking about what we talk about as indigenous data sovereignty and data sovereignty itself is actually a cloud computing term and we we sort of we stole it from that space or we are we appropriated it from that that discipline and data sovereignty was relates to this the that data is subject to the laws of the nation within which it's stored and it was all about um things moving online data moving into the cloud um the cloud not being up in the sky, but you know, sitting in a server on someone's territory. And often that was, you know, an overseas location. And so if there were laws in that country that allowed people to access that data, then they could do that. And we were saying, well, actually, we think the the laws that govern the way that data should be accessed and used should come from the place, should be consistent with the place it comes from. So indigenous data sovereignty became this in verse that stated data is subject to the laws of the nation from which it's collected. And it was also in some ways a plea, not a plea, an assertion that tribal nations were nations as well. Um, and uh, I, you know, that's one of the things that I take from uh, engaging with our relations um, in the US and the way they talk about nations. And in New Zealand, we, you know, we have our iwi, we don't often talk about them as nations, but when you start thinking about uh, things that way, it, it can uh, alter the way you think about sovereignty and think about rights and things as well. So I often talk about the Whakatohia nation, even if no one else does. And it's a, um, it's really been this um, discourse about rights and interests. And there was that element of building on uh, these ideas around Indigenous rights and treaty rights and Stephanie talked about the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, you know, the work that Moana had been involved with helping bring forward. Um, I'm involved with the treaty negotiations for our, our iwi and Aotearoa as well 
And so you know, there's sort of ideas that emerge out of that and fuse the way that we're thinking um, alongside all of the work that have been done around cultural intellectual property rights. Um, things that people have thought about for a long time around uh, traditional knowledge and who has the rights in relation to that and where does that sit when researchers start to uh, do research and gather information about uh, from our communities and start collecting our traditional knowledge and using it but then claiming the copyright so all of these ideas had had sat in that space and then the area which i'd be more involved with around indigenous research ethics and how we use our values to inform what we think appropriate use or appropriate collection of data appropriate research um, looks like and it feeds into those you know those really those themes which um, Stephanie talked about and I keep referring to that because these ideas have been built together or you know the, the thinking around indigenous data sovereignty has been built by people across all of our um, all of our nations and this theme about data for governance and governance of data so how do we access information how do we get it from places so that it can help us make decisions and then if it's being made available and so think about what's happening with everyone talking about open data open science um, as that data is being made available to others should we be involved in the governance of it or when should we be involved in the governance of it so that the sorts of uses of that information are done in ways that we think is appropriate and not uh, not in a different direction so um Tamana Raraunga um, itself, and I'll talk about that, uh, the Māori Data Sovereignty Network, um, came about by bringing people together. And we brought people together to have these discussions, exactly the same one we, we're doing here tonight. Um, what does it mean? Why is it important? How do we get in a position where we can uh, control things? And it happened over a series of, um, a series of different gatherings. Um, should we create an entity that can then be our, our sort of voice that speaks into the space? And, um, and that's, you know, where essentially the genesis of Te Manararaunga happened over uh, half a dozen gatherings over a, a sort of an 18-month period. Um, they really recognised that um, he whenua hau te aoraraunga, te aoraraunga he whenua hau, that you know, this, era, this world around data is a new world for us to be thinking about. And, but there is a lot of opportunity that sits there and how do we engage with it? So the Māori Data Sovereignty Principles were uh, one of the things that Te Manararanga uh, put together and put out. Um, you can find this on the website, um, but you'll see these words that are, you know, really, uh, fundamental concepts within Te Ao Māori, um, representing values, representing um, key ideas around rangatiratanga and whakapapa, whanaungatanga, kotahitanga, manaakitanga, kaitiakitanga, and trying to give them some context in relation to data. So we know what rangatiratanga means in the context of um, the rangatira o tēnā iwi o tēnā iwi, you know, who is the the chief or the leader in relation to these places. So what does it mean in relation to data? Um, you know, how how should we be thinking about those things? And so I've got a few examples of how we started to um, align the idea of rangatiratanga to um, this area around data, um, not as a, uh, a description of all the meanings of rangatiratanga, which are you know wide and varied, but just what it, what we thought it meant in this context and how it related to this idea around authority, and so you know Māori have an inherent right to exercise control over Māori data and Māori data ecosystems, um, jurisdiction that we need to be thinking about where the data is being stored, whether it's in the physical spaces or virtual spaces, and how we can enhance control for current and future generations and that um, Māori have a right to data that's relevant and empowers sustainable self-determination and effective self-governance. So, you know, these aspects that we would associate with rangatiratanga now have a meaning or, or how we give it meaning in this, in this space. So 
that's where uh, Rangatiratanga sit. And while we've got it laid out for um, each of the six, I just wanted to highlight a few. Uh, here's Kotahitanga, um, really thinking about, which is, you know, coming together. We sort of act as one, but thinking about that in relation to collective benefit that data ecosystems are designed and function in ways that enable Māori to derive individual and collective benefit. Um, thinking about building capacity requires the development of a workforce to enable all of these different, um, and enable us to be involved at all these different stages around that data life cycle. Um, and to connect, and that the connections between Māori, but also with our uh, relations around the world, can be supported by the sharing of strategies and resources and ideas. And Stephanie mentioned how the different Indigenous data sovereignty networks uh, worked with each other to um, share, share strategies and goals and, and resources. Uh, and kaitiakitanga. So uh, Māori data shall be stored and transferred in a way that enables and reinforces the capacity of Māori to exercise kaitiakitanga over Māori data or stewardship. Um, ethics that our tikanga and our kawa and mā tauranga shall underpin the protection, access and use of Māori data. And so, you know, when we think about that in the context of um, traditional knowledge, you know, there's particular things. We know that there are protocols associated with it, protocols that support appropriate use of that knowledge. So um, we can think about how uh, those things are shared, or when, when, when our traditional knowledge is shared, how do we ensure that those protocols sit alongside them? But then if we're thinking about the scientific data, and that's being, you know, if we're recognizing that as indigenous data or Māori data, what are the protocols that sit around the sharing in that space? And think about, you know, those things. So that um, when it's appropriate for us to put restrictions in place, we'll decide which data shall be controlled, which all might be tapu, and then which ones are open, uh, which we would think about as being more. So, uh, the sort of trying to um, uh, bring forward our te ao Māori, Māori values, Māori knowledge and have it inform and infuse the sorts of things that are happening around uh, this data space was then also the subject of many of the conversations we had. So you know, after Te Manarurang was developed, uh, we continued to meet and have um, workshops and gatherings that, you know, started to think about um, what is the Māori worldview? Where do rights and interests around data sit? What are the key concepts that would inform the way we think about it? And part of it was um, being able to um, assert and what is the basis upon which we assert our interests in data? And when we're talking about that, we're um, you know, really thinking about all those forms of data which, um, which Stephanie described. Uh, from information about our territories, information about our people, and information about our culture and history. So we um, have the treaty. Um, people, a lot of people are familiar with the Treaty of Waitangi, and it's really the sort of constitutional basis for our rights. And while it hasn't always been, uh, while it hasn't always been recognized, um, it's one of those um, things that uh, we're constantly using to refine and redefine our rights. And so Tonga is one of the things that's protected within the, uh, within the treaty uh, in terms of te tino rangatiratanga o rato whenua o rato kainga me o rato taonga katoa. So all of our lands, all of our um, uh, kainga spaces, kind of places, and then all of our taonga. Um, Oh yeah, lands, villages, and all things precious. And so we say that data is a precious thing. And so data is a taonga, and that language, um, after a few years, now starts to appear in government policy and government documents, and people talk about it um, as, you know, that's just uh, normal to recognize data as a taonga. But getting to that point required us to do, you know, a range of different things. We um, 
have a Waitangi tribunal which thinks about uh, or, or looks into grievances with the Crown and they often, you know, making decisions about um, in relation to language, te reo and where that sits. And so we got some lawyers, because lawyers are always useful at times, uh, to um, put together a paper saying, you know, if the tribunal was going to think about whether data was a, was a taonga, what, what, what would it come to? And, you know, it said for something to be recognised as a taonga, it has to be valued and treasured by Māori, and it's got to be significant and important to Māori. So in relation to data, this is likely to be context specific. And so some data is more likely to be a taonga or closer to a taonga and other ones a little bit further away. Uh, so we sort of accepted that. We had our own gatherings or workshops that then started to think about, um, you know, that what's the inherent value of the taonga, uh, the inherent value of the data, and then the, the specific value of the data and thinking about that as a sort of like an intrinsic mana and an extrinsic mana. So all data are taonga, a little bit like we would uh, think about the environment. You know, every plant is, uh, is precious in the environment. And then you've got this sort of other part of it where uh, taonga is uh, where there are some things in the environment which we focus on. We don't focus on everything. We focus on protecting some bits more than others because for whatever the value, cultural value, commercial value, whatever that sort of value that drives that is, um, and that's in the way we act. Even though philosophically, we believe that everything is everything is precious. So, you know, these sorts of ideas that would then encourage us to think about um, how that might apply to to data as well. And there's a range of you know, other ideas around mana and modi and, and tapu and what those things, um, what those things might look like. So, um, we also did things like um, uh, work with uh, people that did interviews with uh, tohunga or kahuna and um, spoke with them about what were the things that informed their sharing of their knowledge? So we know not everyone gets everything. They'll only share certain things with some people and certain things with others. And some of it is for everyone and some of it isn't. And so what were the ideas that informed the way they would allow knowledge to be shared traditionally? And so that's what sits there um, in those... Uh, ideas and those words uh, in the diagram and you probably kind of recognize that there's enough linguistic similarities between uh, Maori and Hawaiian for to kind of get a bit of a, a sense of what those things are but when we um, looked at the ideas we realized that there were some of the things when we're thinking about tapu and noa that related to the data itself there were some of the ideas like pono and tika that related to the use of the data and there were some of the ideas like pukenga and kaitiaki that related to the users and so these elements we could shape into something that would allow us to assess or think about what sorts of different data sets could be used for what sorts of different things and that got turned into this set of questions so we had the, the concepts as they sit there in the left hand side um, we sort of thought about them what was the characteristic of them that was being um, referred to so tapu what's the level of sensitivity um, nor what's the level of accessibility now it's not necessarily like a strict translation but it's trying to give a, an idea of the things about the data that are relevant to whether you would try and keep something tapu or kapu. Now, you wouldn't try and keep it away if all your cousins are sharing it on Facebook. So if people can find it just out there, then actually no one uses Facebook anymore, only old people, eh? That's right. If they're putting it on Instagram, 
I don't even know if that's the sort of modern enough version. Anyway, so you know, that's it's sort of that sort of thing. So there's things are balanced. It's not ends up uh, doesn't end up being a hard and fast. And so you sort of try and do an assessment of that. And then there's um, elements around um, the value or the trust or the originality or the application. And those are the things that related to sort of like the data use, what was the purpose of it? And then you had these elements around what sort of relationship you had with the data, what sort of expertise or authority or responsibility did you have in relation to how that would be used as a user um, to then also inform the way you would think about this. So this is uh, something that was um, worked up. And um, I guess the interesting thing around this is that it then became a way of us thinking about how uh, Māori values would inform uh, access to decisions. And so one of our Māori colleagues in the, uh, the Statistics New Zealand, Jacinta Paranihi, um, she you know, took this model, took these questions, and then took it into a practical context within their organisation. And so they have... Um, an integrated data infrastructure. This is where they take information that's collected from, you know, you go and engage with the housing department or social services or education or health. That's generating data all the time. Um, and information used to just sit in those places. So if you went to the health department, it would only be used for health purposes. You went to education, it would only be used for education purposes. Now, because we're so, uh, we either think we're so smart or we're so smart, we can kind of loop them all together. And, you know, a, a lot of this might also relates to things like social economic determinants of health. So we know that health just isn't about health stuff. It's about these other relationships. But to make an understanding around that, you have to bring that stuff together. So we'd probably do it a different way, but this is how the government's doing it with all their data sets. And then they put it all together. It's de-identified and researchers have to apply for access to it. So they fill in, you know, they make an application and they were using these um, five, the five saves, these things on the right-hand side. And that was uh, sort of like the Parkia model, the Howley model that was informing their, um, the way they would decide whether or not you could get access to it. And this is one that's used in England, Australia, all those kind of uh, sort of places. So, um, working with Jacinta, we saw that our 10 kind of ideas that we had, we could line them up with their five and uh, ended up creating um, this um, framework called Ngāti Kanga Paihere, which sort of blended them together. And um, they trialled this for uh, sort of six months on actual projects, actual things that people were wanting to do and realized that it actually gave them better, better results. And so now this is what they use to, if people wanna get information from, uh, from the integrated data infrastructure, this is the framework that guides the, the protocols for access. So it was kind of a, it was a really nice, um, a really nice example of uh, Māori ethics, Māori ideas, Māori values, Māori concepts, being able to inform um, data practices. The other, um, couple other, there's just a couple more things I just wanted to sort of mention a little bit. Um, so one of these is, um, you know, really thinking about, um, you know, the topic, uh, science and the sacred. And this is a research project, which my community is involved in. Um, I'm a part of it as well, uh, both from a, uh, iwi point of view, but also from an institutional point of view. And it's looking at marine heat waves and modeling ocean currents. And our uh, iwi is interested in that because we've got offshore mussel farms. Uh, so we're interested in, you know, how, how that development will be affected by change of uh, climate change and changing temperatures. Uh, but also the effect that might have on our uh, customary kind of food gathering across um, across our coastlines. So on the left-hand side, Maruhiatu is one of our chants that speaks to um, sites of importance along the coast. 
some of them related to re gathering resources, some of them related to significant events. And so, you know, sort of that sits there and, and frames our understanding of what's important across that part of the landscape. On the right hand side is the places where we sampled uh, mussels from. So I went to all these places because we're trying to understand the, the relationships between the, uh, the different mussel populations around the coast. So we can understand where our spat comes from, so we can protect that, so that that and you know supports future supply. But they overlay with each other, and for us, both of those sets of information are going to be important to us in terms of the sorts of decisions we'd like to make. Now, one of the issues though is that as this information comes forward, how open should it be, or if it is shifting into an open space, how do we um, maintain a, some control or some recognition in relation to it as it travels. And so that's where you see the, um, uh, the sort of the labels sitting above it, traditional knowledge labels associated with the kind of traditional knowledge content and biocultural labels associated with the scientific content. And that's what we use to inform the sorts of protocols that we want, that we want to travel with that information as it moves around. Um, and so really just in closing, I just wanted to say, um, you know, all of these things have come about from people getting together and having a, uh, or what do you call it? Um, or little, little, uh, korero, rero, you know, having that, um, that space for that, that conversation is how all of these things have come about both um, you know, within our own country, but with our relations from around the world. And um saying, uh, hea te menui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. So, you know, what's the most important thing? It's people, it's people, it's people. Moreira, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Mahalo, mahalo nui e Stephanie a e Maui. Um, we're going to ask for Stephanie to be highlighted here so we can begin to ask some questions. Uh, mahalo to everybody. We have about half an hour left to ask questions. Um, I see Maui's video is off. I did want to, um, I'm going to, we, we have seven questions and I'm going to facilitate and ask kind of maybe more broad to more specific. So. We'll, we'll answer them a little bit out of order. So um, I guess one question I have for both Maui and Stephanie is the second question, which is what kind of infrastructure did, you know, having this discussions, these discussions around indigenous data require? You know, Maui, you spoke about getting together. Um, Stephanie, you also have, you know, brought up these principles and policies. Um, in one sense, you have, you, you brought up, you know, the Treaty of Waitangi as what you kind of lean on. Many other tribes, tribes are tribes and have federal recognition. Um, you know, we as Kanaka Maoli, we don't have federal recognition. I'm not saying we should have it or we shouldn't have it. But I'm wondering if there's some, in your opinion, is there some kind of minimal level of organization or, um, yeah, what are the ingredients that we need? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, so I'll, I'll start, but I'm sure Stephanie will jump on. Um, hey, look, you know, I think we've been in a situation in Aotearoa where the treaty hasn't always been recognised. And, you know, um, it, it comes forward at different times and it sort of is, you know, recognised in some places and not in others. So we never essentially put all of our eggs in one basket. There's always, you know, another... Um, avenue or another um, support for where we're trying to get to. So whether that's uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, whether it's just thinking about equity, um, you know, there's the justice, was it justice, equity, diversity and inclusion, um, kind of, you know, sort of I'm not sure. I'm, I, I understand. I thought people knew about Jedi, but apparently it's only in some spaces. But you know, there's different ways that you can encourage the people you're working with to have a relationship with you that allows you to participate. 
you know, participatory action research, um, co-design. There's all these different uh, things that can push you at a local level into a practice that then just makes sense. Thank you, and Stephanie? I think one of the other powerful things that you saw through Maui's presentation was the ability to ground um, action in language and values. And so I see that as a real strength that you can have um, that is harder to activate on a um, more aggregate level in the US because we have such varied and distinct cultures and languages, right? So we can't all come together to create this framework within um, uh, within a common language, right? But um, in Hawaii, um, there are opportunities, um, I think that you have um, through your relations and through language to be able to do that kind of work um, in a way that kind of, re that reflects the work that's been um, da done um, for Maori as well. Um, and I think that's powerful because the conversations that I've, that I've participated in, in for instance, the lower 48 or the continent on the continent, basically, um, with tribes are sometimes the most powerful conversations because when you can talk about these in language um, or within your own value systems, you begin to see how um, you don't need so much expertise from the external world, right? You need to ground yourself in the in um, what's meaningful and how we caretake and, and how we behave and what protocol is within our own communities. Um, and that we have that. Um, we have that power and that knowledge within us and within our communities to do that work already. Um, and that, I think, reflects upwards, right? And it sets these expectations for how we, ex how we um, want others to behave with our, um, as, as uh, Maui, was, uh, Maui was referring to, Tonga, right? As the things that are really meaningful, the data and the information and our knowledge that are meaningful to us. Yes, mahalo nui. I was really struck by just the power of using those cultural terms, you know, just even starting with you, Stephanie, and saying data are relations. And then Maui, for you to pick that up and say they're more than just relations, you know, data is taung taunga, it's like valued, it has mana. Um, I think that's something that everybody, a lot of people coming in were just like, isn't data just data? And kind of giving those, those, those words to that. Um, maybe moving that question to something in the chat is, you know, I saw that you utilize words like noa and tapu. So for, for your experience, how did the Maori indigenous sovereignty community decide to, to be more proactive versus everything is kapu, you know? Um, I'd love to hear that. I'm sure it was exciting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so... I'm, I'm trying to trying to work out how to answer this question properly. So there's a there's a, an element of doing things where you just kind of do it. You know, you just because because part of it is is trying to work out what is the right sort of context, and you have to uh, go out there. Maybe maybe I'm just feeling a little bit like my namesake, um, and you know, it's a bit of an adventurer sort of out into different places new terrain, you go and you see, you know, whether these things work or not, and then you bring it back and have a discussion about it. And I think that's, you know, really what we were able to do is um, bring together enough people that were prepared to go on that journey, jump in the waka, see where it took us, and then come back and say, hey, look, you know, we can be thinking about these things in this sort of way. And that going back to the community and getting a sense of whether what we're talking about makes sense to them because they're the ones that have to carry it forward. And I think one of the things that really pushed things forward for us was that, um, was actually the tribal leadership. And so the ability to get um, that those sorts of ideas uh, understood and accepted in our sort of our iwi leader space. And for them to say, actually, we recognize that data is really important we're going to create our own entity to advocate for that as well at a political level. And that's what really drove, um, I think, kind of embedded it in our sort of federal level politics um, here in Aotearoa. You know, I thank you for, again, explaining the journey through a cultural lens of let's all get into the va'a or into the vaka because I think 
having a protective and a fear-based mentality about it, that is almost kind of the response to being in a Western kind of um, governance context. Um, I want to switch gears. There's a lot of people putting some questions in the chat to the hosts and panelists, so you all might not see it, but I'm going to switch to a question that came in on the chat that asks, this is very thought provoking and lots to consider. And I want to ask Stephanie, maybe you can start talking about this. This person is struggling what seems to be a contradiction between the idea of open data and data that are owned and controlled by any entity. So there's lots of efforts to get governments, agencies, and individuals to share data freely and openly, but data sovereignty seems contradictory to this. So, um, yeah, can you <laughs> can you help us um, uh, untangle uh, or you know start to dissect and, and think about this conversation? Sure. So I think there's there's two tacks I want to take on this. One is that. Um, I talked a little bit about the FAIR principles, so making data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and those principles are geared towards helping data be in this open sphere, right? To, to, make, it, um, to make it useful and, um, and shareable. And, um, you know, when, when Indigenous data sovereignty was just really coalescing around these concepts and putting forth the CARE principles, a lot of people considered that uh, the care principles were in direct conflict with with open data and share and data sharing and those kinds of things. Um, but the grounding concepts around how we make data open um, and what we do to data to make it available are things that we need for indigenous data because we know that there are so many um, of our relations out there in these biobanks and in um, these data sets that because they don't have the associated metadata, so the, the data about data that tell us the provenance information um, or the attribution information, we cannot connect to that. And that's part of us, right? And so we need on one hand to have these data be um, become more accessible to our, um, our communities by enriching it and making it more shareable. And then at the other side, um, we also are, in this arena, and now we talked a little bit about it, of um, how do we build up institutions and build up these open science expectations so that they are infused from the beginning um, with the ethics and expectations of not only indigenous peoples, but people world, worldwide, people in general, because the systems that are there are nascent. That, and this is something that people need to understand is that we're not like way behind in for terms of indigenous peoples coming up with the ways that we interact with and care for our data. In fact, we have these long histories of having these protocols and practices in place. Um, but the mainstream is, is also um, very much behind in coming up with the policies and practices for how, um, what the rules are around data. And so if we're able to make sure that um, we begin to infuse from the start, so when they're building databases, when they're setting up the, the policies for repositories, or when they're creating university policies, because most universities don't even have data governance policies, right? Um, so when they're creating those policies that we have a seat at the table from the start, um, and that we can infuse those policies with things that make um, and build accountability into systems, that build trust into systems, and allow us to have leverage and, and changes so that you know, sometimes, and this goes back to what Maui was saying, sometimes you may put a system, there's data in it, but it's not shared all the time. It's only shared sometimes. Um, and you can build systems that do that, um, but you only want to put your data in there if you trust. And so it, it comes from building up these relationships um, that are um, really started by what we were talking about being in person, right? Being able to have these connections, um, but then also are solidified into policies right, and guidelines and practices so that um, when things happen, you can fall back on those. Thank you. You know, something that I picked up on what you just said, I'm sorry, um, is, is the idea that we think of the West as being ahead, but, but perhaps really more the data governance policies have actually been evolving with technology, whereas indigenous data sovereignty policies have been evolving with knowledge and our knowledge systems are, are old. Maui, please pick it up. Yeah, yeah. So 
Look, one, one of the things, um, one of the reasons why I think this is the case is that um, a lot of the, in, in kind of the Western uh, kind of space, things have been, uh, been framed around property and sort of individual rights for, you know, hundreds of years now. And so there's this kind of really um, deep um, cultural a attachment to those ideas. You dig below that, you realize that they used to treat things in commons as well. And when we're starting to deal with um, data in this place, and particularly as you're trying to push it into open spaces, there's um, how, you, how you think about the data as a commons. So you can say, look, these are appropriate uses, and but there's some sort of boundaries around that. That's more like how we deal with things. And so it's easier for us to reach to ideas and concepts that inform that kind of behavior than it is for you know a number of our other sorts of colleagues but the you know if you go back far enough it's it ends up being a shared tradition in lots of ways um i did want to say you know there's one of the one of the challenges around pushing things out into an open space is really what sits behind a lot of this because it's um what is those other uses and when those other uses are inappropriate and so that sort of misappropriation or there's a word we have kaiatanga um, sort of the appropriation of of things which which um, which comes about, but it's not just um, open uh, sort of open data isn't just about access. It's also about attribution and it's also about authority, and those are the pieces which um, you know people focus too much on the access component, not enough about actually you know as, as um, Stephanie said how is how uh how is the community being connected to that information so that when the information travels the information about that community travels too so that other person that wants to use the data that has got no kind of connection to them knows who they who they might go to or who they might engage with if they want to use it in a, a an appropriate way or outside the sorts of approved ways so you know finding ways to recognize where that authority sits ends up being a sort of first stage in um, enabling communities to exercise governance or any kind of authority or decision making over what appropriate use looks like. Thank you, that's wonderful. I'm going to ask a couple of the questions from the Q&A, the ones at the end, kind of thinking around um, should there be legal ramifications for misuse and misrepresentation um, of Indigenous data and I don't know either of you kind of want to begin addressing that. The um, yeah, so look, I've this this and this is this ends up being one of the um, where we've been sort of working with the you know the use of the traditional knowledge labels, thinking about them as tags that are more educative and informative rather than being able to be enforced. Uh, I think it's a um, it's a challenging one you know you've got intellectual property and even if people have intellectual property it can only be enforced if you want to go to court so even to get an enforcement of intellectual property there's often barriers to that coming about it might be happening outside your country you know a whole sort of range of things um i think when it's clear to people that they shouldn't be using our stuff because it's very clearly saying, don't use our stuff like this or don't commercialize this, then when they do, when you call them out, they can't go, oh, sorry, I didn't know. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't address the, the, all of the bad actors, you know, because there's like some ones that are just don't care, won't care, do whatever. And I don't know how you get around that stuff, but at least if we are changing the people that want to do the right thing and want to work with us to do the right thing and make it uh, make the systems help people to do the right thing rather than have to try and work around the system to do the right thing. That's essentially what we want to try and be in a position to do. Thank I'll you. just add, I think, you know, the legal system is really largely from a Western framework, right? And so we're operating within um, that point of view when we use, um, you know, uh, when we go that route, um, it can be a sharp tool to be used as appropriate. Um, 
But on the other hand, I think as Maui was saying that we can gain um, a lot um, and actually infuse more of the responsibilities and relations that we want to into um, data and how data are used and how data are treated by using some of the other, what we tend to refer to as like extra legal tools. So things other than legal options. Um, and so it, it gives us this whole other horizon. And so there, you know, there's, there's a time and a place I think for the law, but it also it makes us think within that really, really narrow perspective of, of what we're doing and how we relate to things. And I guess kind of related to that is, have you kind of, have either of you kind of worked with communities or been involved with kind of, um, regulating this data collection when when practices aren't following the the framework not just should it but like do you also have actual policies around you know that, that other aspect i think what you see in um uh, in in the u.s um is there's a lot of action that's been around for decades through research governance mechanisms so through tribal research review boards tribal irbs um, that enact a lot of the concepts that we're talking about here um, so through doing things like um, having to get approval to do research with um and with with in the, with the community members even if they live off um, off tribal lands, which is an important concept to think about, right? So if you're talking about um, my tribe, you, you have to be respectful and, and get approval, right? Um, and the other, the other concepts too are thinking about um, how rights uh, to and responsibilities to territories also are in existence there. And some of these um, tribal laws and, and policies have been there. Um, they also often use things like publications review processes. So publications must be reviewed before uh, before being published um, as a kind of process to do that. Um, and I've also heard of now um, other entities besides tribes who are going who are might be putting those policies in place. For instance, if they're running a repository that has indigenous data in it, um, or they are doing a research project themselves to try to enhance and and quote unquote enforce. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say, leading back to both this point and the point about the law, is that um, one of the other tools that we have out there or that we should have out there, it's a concept now for us um, in the United States, is really this idea about how do we assess data relationships, right? And so we, um, as recipients of federal or state funds, right, have to report a lot of data back to the, the, the entity that gives us this um, the money, right? Um, but we never assess them as how they are serving our needs um, and protecting our data and using that information. And so this is a concept that I think is also underutilized is how do we begin to um, make that a two-way relationship? Um, and you see some of that work beginning to happen in Canada, um, and especially within um, uh, British Columbia, really thinking through the concept of what does a nation-to-nation -nation relationship look like or is a, you know, a sovereign entity with um, a state relationship look like? Thank you. I'm going to group a couple of questions here together because I think that they relate to different kind of professions, different fields, but are all asking similar questions. So someone asks, someone's working with, say, digital language technology, like machine translation, wanting to best respect indigenous sovereignty. Um, Andrea's is participating in collection of ecological and environmental data and wants to kind of understand the provenance. So it, those two questions sound really, how do, how do, we, how do we start this? Um, how do we start to have good relations with the data and with the land and the peoples that they come from? So there's a, I'm, the starting point for all of these conversations is usually appropriate consultation and, you know, go talk to the right people and these things. Sometimes that's um, easier said than done. Sometimes the, the context in which you're operating captures a whole range of data across a whole, you know, like a big area, you know, people think about like um, uh, drone, drone data that comes from drones or satellites, uh, things like that. So what does it mean? You know, what are the steps? What sorts of things should you be thinking about 
um, whether you're in a position to engage with people directly or not. And I think it's um, one thing is disclosing that there's an indigenous interest that relates to that material. I mean, I think that, you know, it's sort of not good enough to just go, um, uh, couldn't work out what it is, therefore it's not, doesn't exist. I mean, even if there's an interest, you know there's an interest there because it was taken from this place. They haven't had a chance yet to talk to what that is, but they may have that opportunity in the future and leaving a space for that to happen. And that's one of the things we're going to try and do through um, the use of the traditional knowledge labels, or at least putting in place notices that, that do that work, create a space that can then be filled by the community when they're, when they're able to bring their voice to it. Um, and and doing that, and, and particularly if you do then get the chance to um, have the community involved, then, they're in, then they can bring um, other information which they think is relevant to that context and put it in, put it in place as well. Mahalo, Stephanie, I don't know if you wanted to add into that. Otherwise, I'll move on to another question. You can move on. I'll leave space okay. for another one. Um, I want to go for this question, which is when thinking about decolonizing data, I don't know if data can be decolonized or if you indigenize it, I don't know. In your opinions, would you support, would this support reducing systemic racism, especially in cases when the collected data is used to create logarithms that are claimed to be neutral? Are you, are you going for this one? So, so all, all, I, all I can say is, um, so we've got a research project called Tikarang on Technology, and it's got a component that has um, an element that talks about decolonizing algorithms and another component that's about indigenizing algorithms. And so, you know, it, it's, it's on both of those situations. There's some, some data that is being used to make decisions which blatantly the outcomes are um, inequitable or racist and what sorts of things can be done as that's being put together to stop that sort of thing happening. And then there's, you know, maybe the same data can be used or maybe it's different data that we want to use automated decision-making processes to help us meet an outcome we're interested in. And that's what I think, you know, indigenizing is a part of it. But Stephanie? Yeah, I'll just add that I think one of the important concepts that you hear and what Maui is saying is that um, from a very basic perspective, like indigenous peoples are, are often left out of analyses, right? Because our number is too small, right? And that's not because our number is too small, it's because the methods are inadequate. And so what Maui's talking about is how do you indigenize um, the methods and infuse the methodologies, our, our values into the process? And what are you gonna come out with at, an, at the end? How is the algorithm gonna look different if you, if you create it from an indigenous perspective? Um, how is the statistical analysis gonna look different if you create it from an indigenous perspective? And so that goes back to my, my concept there of thinking not, not of the challenges, but the opportunities we have. Mahalo Nui, I think that is just a wonderful place to pause our conversation and I, I do see it as a pause because I know that we'll be um, talking with you again in the future as we learn more and um, I just wanted to um, finish up our discussions. Um, now I'm trying to find <laughs> which, there we go, I was going to say I'm trying to find my, 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 my uh, screen. Sada, am I sharing the right screen? Can you guys see my screen? I hope it is the right screen. Yes, can. Okay, in any case, I do want to ask that you come and come back for more and join us in our upcoming seminars. The next seminar is Mauli Au Honua. And if you were really like struck by, wow, there's all this personal health information being collected, how do we ensure that that corporal legacy of our ancestors continues to thrive for our people? That's April 27th. We will be looking into Hana no Eau, what creations and innovations are Maoli and what protections exist and are needed. And finally, we'll end with what platforms and approaches um, are out there. Um, so again, please register to visit Sciences in the Sacred. And again, our speakers next time will be Dr. Keolu Fox, Dr. Desi Small Rodriguez, and will be facilitated by Kauka Emanaluli. So mahalo nui, and let's please, if you want to um, show by sh putting an emoji or joining me and thanking our speakers, mahalo.